God. Oh, we worship you, God. Does anybody understand that we need the Lord today? Can you articulate that to the Lord? Can you verbalize that to the Lord? Out of your heart, just say, don't be ashamed of your desperation. Don't be afraid of your need. Oh, we need you, God. We need you, God. We need you. We need you, God. Yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, how we need you. Oh, how I need you. Every day and every hour. As a congregation, we need you. As a community, we need you. As the people of God, we we need you. We need you. We need you. Can you tell the Lord, I need you. I need you. I need you. Oh God, I need you. I need you. I know I need you, God. I need you. When things are good, I need you. when they're bad, I, need I still you. need you, Lord. You are my God. You are my source. You are my help. Hallelujah. Who's not ashamed to say, I? It's me, oh God. Standing in the need of prayer. Go back to we. We need you. We do. We need you. We need you, Lord. Let your glory. We need an outpouring of your spirit. We need to witness your miracles. We need to touch your hymn, Jesus. We need your healing to break out in this place. We need your abundance to break out. We need your deliverance to break out in this place. We need your word to go forth. We need your spirit to sanctify us. One more time, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you, Lord. Let your glory. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord. Come on, come on. Come on, put our hands together for the Lord. of your grace and your truth. We have been sanctified through your truth, oh God. We have been brought into the body of God, of Christ, the family of God, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you have moved in us. Holy Spirit, you have baptized us. Holy Spirit, you have filled us. God, Holy Spirit, we worship you. For you dwell in us, revealing the Son to us. 
for you dwell in us, revealing grace to us. You live inside of us, pushing out sin, pushing out waywardness, pushing out insubordination, driving out wickedness, driving out disobedience, drawing the glory of God, 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 and drawing the glory of God, and all the while drawing the glory of God, drawing the glory of God, drawing the power of God. Drawing the ability of God. Drawing the authority of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, the Holy Spirit, we worship you. Oh God, the Holy Spirit, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, come on. Let's put our hands together and bless him. Hallelujah. Come on, let's put our hands together and bless him. Come on, let's put our hands together and bless him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, you are the lifter of every head. Oh God, you are the bearer of every burden. Oh God, you are the savior of all men, God. But you appear to those who have accepted your grace. Hallelujah. So today, with expectant hearts, God, with made of minds, oh God, with strengthened will and resolve, we turn our face to you. We turn our souls to you. We turn ourselves to you. Today, God, give us the strength to turn from our, weak our weaknesses, to turn from wickedness. Give us the strength to turn to you. Give us the strength to turn to you. Oh God, save those who don't know you. God, fill those who are unfulfilled. Direct those who are groping in darkness. Renew those who feel expired. Strengthen those who are uninspired. I need a touch from you, God. Can anybody just say that? I need a touch from you, God. I need a blessing from you, God. I need you, God. So, Lord, hallelujah. I ask that you just remember our loved ones today. Remember those who are firm today. Heal their bodies today, God. God, those who are stricken in other ways, touch God. Bind the work of the enemy, God. Bind the lies of the enemy, God. And reveal your plan and truth. Oh, God, we got work to do. 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 Hallelujah. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hey, hallelujah. So, God, let your work, let your work, let your work happen in our mouths, in our ears, in our hands, in our feet, in our songs, God, in our talents, in our spiritual gifts, God, in our work, in our families, in our children, in our parents, God. Let your will be done in us. 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 Oh God, oh God, let your will be done in us. Oh God, those who are in root, bless them, God. Those who are in ruts, bless them, God. Those who are present, thank you for them, God. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in us, who you are in us and in spite of us. We are so, so excited about you, God. We love you today. 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 We love you. We love you today. We 
love you, God. We love you today, 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 God. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. love you today, God. The rivers of God's love is trying to reach someone today. The rivers of God's spirit is trying to free someone. Whenever we are in the presence of God's people, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want you to know that whatever holds you today, the spirit, the spirit of God is in this place. Whatever limits you, the spirit of the Lord is in this place. Whatever challenges your trajectory, the spirit of of the Lord is in this place. Ah, whatever holds you, limited to your own strength, the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. So God, Father, Son, and Spirit, make a revelation, reveal the true strength and the love and the capacity of our God. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You are the shepherd who knows each of us by name. Every hair on our head. Or every hair that used to be on our head. You know us. You know us. You know us. So today, just breathe on your people again. And help us. Help us to give glory to your name. For you are God. You are God. Our soul worthy of our pray these things in the matchless name of your Son and our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Come on, take your seat. Wonderful job, worship team. Brother Arian, it's good to see you, man. I was in back and I kept saying, I know that voice. I know that voice from somewhere. I know that voice from somewhere. Oh, hey, found the life. It is good to see you all today. And it's good to be in the Lord's, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Um, you know what? It's when you've been off for a while and just chilling, sometimes it feels like a struggle to get back, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord. And God has been so good and so faithful and so wonderful. And um, I just trust that you all are as good as you look. And I trust that God's grace has been so good to you. And I trust that you are endeavoring to, to, um, to know his will and to know his plan and to know the things that God has in store for you. I'm so, 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 so glad about that. Hey, Dr. Karen, can I put up one picture? I just want to show you all. What I've been, for those of you who don't know, um, I've been out for the month of August. And when I'm out, I try to do things that are easier than ministry. No, 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 no. You all, you all don't understand how refreshed I am to be in your presence um, and to know that you pray for us and that you encourage us um, and that you give us space to do the things that we, that we need to do. And so each August, what I try to do is I save up my vacation throughout the year um, and I try to take it in August so that it can be really just a concentrated period of time. And, um, and so my family and I had a great time. We had a chance to get out of the country for a couple of weeks. We were in Mexico for... Uh, for two weeks, we got a chance just to chill and just to be in each other's presence. Um, and again, I have to keep saying this because in some place, I have so many pastors who are afraid to step away for a period of time. But I know that I have tremendous women and men who stood in this pulpit with great transparency and ministered in my absence. And I really want to honor each and every one of you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. And just the ministers and the pastors who have stepped up, who who give us space. Again, not many people can do that, to not bother us and to let us just really disconnect so that we can really connect with the Lord. And so um, just the way you all have stepped up and have ministered, I got a, um, a text message this morning from an old classmate. We were in track together 35 years ago. His son-in-law passed away um, and asked, could I do the, do the memorial service? And I wrote back to say I was out of town. But he wrote me this morning to say, Pastor Kevin, that you, that you blessed 
their family. For me to be away and knowing that a classmate's trying to find me and that we have pastors who stepped up. And I got a note this morning about how, how well you ministered to their family. I appreciate that, brother. I really, I really do. And so I try to reset myself. I just try to, you know, break loose and just say, God, talk to me in new ways. Give me new experiences. And you know what? And I've told myself after I jumped last time, I wouldn't do it again. I told myself, and listen, contrary to popular beliefs, this time it was not the Korean brothers that got to me who made me jump last time. It was the only brother in the plane. It was not my white brothers that got to me this time. It was the brothers. Three black men made me jump out an airplane this time. They said, no, you jump with the other brothers. This time you got to jump with us. And um, thank God that that plane was good because the covenant would have lost four good brothers. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh. So listen, I wasn't going to do it before. I wasn't going to do it because last, I just kept having flashbacks of what this was like last time. And so you need people who push you. You hate those kinds of people, but you need them. You need people who push you like crazy. And so I'm okay with 12,000 feet. Like, yeah, like 12,000 is okay. But the highest point at which you can jump, the legal, I mean, the world's highest is 18,000. Do you not know these fools said take us 18,000? In fact, in fact, they said take us 18,500. But because that is illegal, they did not take us 18.5. They took us 18,000 feet. And last time I was the first to jump. And so I just said, I asked my jump master, I said, this is all I ask. Don't let us be the first one. You know, I wanted to know how he was doing. You know, I was praying for him and his family, his strength, his mental clarity, his stability. I was hoping his relationship was going well. I was really, I hope he had, this man had something to live for. Um, you know, I hope he had somebody good in his life. I hope that he had a meaningful relationship with his father. Um, really, I really understand. Listen, let me tell you something. Listen, when you up in the air like that with somebody, you don't care who they vote for. <laughs> you don't care about their politics. We were down in Florida. You don't care about a whole lot of stuff. I just want to know, were you clear? Are you all right? Did you eat a breakfast? Did you eat breakfast this morning? Um, but you know, once I agreed to do it, they make you sign like 15 pages. If there are any attorneys here, this is ignorant. This is the most stupid. Listen, jumping is not bad. It's the fact that you indemnify these people. You say, no matter what, I cannot sue you. That if that man just said, ah, and just cut both my straps. <laughs> I literally signed something so stupid. And here's what's even more stupid. <laughs> the person who organized it did it in a way so that we weren't able to even let our wives know. I know that's bad, so I'm just repenting right now. <laughs> My wife is still mad at me for doing it. But anyway, went up, and uh, we're like the third one out. This is 3.4 miles up in the air. The free fall is 90 seconds. You fall at 120 feet, 120 miles um, an hour, and the free fall is like 90 seconds. And uh, contrary to what you might think, it's not like that roller coaster feeling in your stomach. Um, you just don't feel anything. You just jump. You just feel like you're just, you're just flying. Um, but I just, I just wanted to show you. I just like to do stuff that just gives me a, um, just a reset. Um, I got to tell you, right here is when he opened the parachute. I was really thankful because the free fall is cool, but, um, but the parachute is godly. And, um, <laughs> but let me, we're, you all, we are so high. I mean, like when you're flying at 10,000 feet, they tell you you can use your handheld electronics. We're at 18,000 feet. And um, we were in, um, I think it's called Titusville. We were near Cocoa Beach. But I could see Cape Canaveral as we jumped. We're 60 miles away from Orlando. I could see downtown Disney from there. He's like, that's downtown Disney right there. And he's going to ask me, do you, hey, do you want to see the sharks? Which would mean flying over the ocean. I knew God wasn't in there. Then he wants to know, I said, I don't want to see the sharks or the alligators. Just put me right down on that X <laughs> on the ground. But I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. After I got down, my fear left. And so if the church ever wants to do a field trip <laughs> to go jump, I'm up for it. It got rid of a lot of my fears, and I realized... Dude, I deal with stuff on a daily basis that scares me, and I'm up here jumping out of planes. I'm going to reset my mind. And, um, and so um, I'm just really excited. And so I'm glad to be back on the ground. And um, hey, 
Patrick Gates, I got a word for you. And, um, <laughs> and Brett Walker, I got a word for both of y'all afterwards. Um, but just being a, having a chance to be with folks um, who are freshmen, even though it was time off, I was with other pastors who had time off as well. And folks who just pushed me to believe bigger, dream bigger, and to trust God. And uh, it's just such a, such a good time. So I just want to just let you all know that, um, that I feel really refreshed. That about two weeks into this, into this time off, I felt like the reset button was hit. I felt like there was a turnabout. I felt like I had exhaled as much as I could. And I just felt like um, God was just giving me strategies about how to breathe more deeply and how to enjoy life more and how to celebrate his grace more and how to be a more faithful servant and how to enjoy each moment. And so um, I'm just excited about being back. I'm excited about what God has in store for us. And, um, and I'm, just, I'm just really, really grateful that I have a congregation that gives us space to do what we do. They have a family that supports me um, and, or forgives me for doing stuff like, like this. And friends who also understand that we got to really dream higher and dream bigger. What we have realized, and this came up a bit in the men's group I did years ago, that as we are really pursuing the purposes and the passions that God has given us, it makes us less prone to the temptations of the enemy. I think when we're moping around, the enemy can catch us. That's why the Bible tells us to resist the devil. But I think as we pursue what God has for us, it puts such excitement in our hearts that the enemy has trouble keeping up with us. And I know there were new levels, that there are new temptations, but I just want to encourage someone here today to fully pursue what it is God wants you to do. Fully pursue what God is calling you to do. And do it with great joy, and do it with great energy, and do it with great excitement. Because God delights he delights in, in the fact that we pursue what it is he wants us to do. Not our own plan, not our own purpose, but he delights when we run after God with our whole hearts. My prayer today is that you really run with God, for God with your whole heart. Um, Pastor Patrick put up this message. This, he read this text today. It's from 2 Corinthians 4. Um, I just want to reference it, and then I just want to just just encourage your hearts a little bit um, as we get in as we get into this message. It talks about the God of this age blinding the minds in verse four of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, "Let light shine out of darkness," made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed. Excuse me, in the face of Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is of God and not of ourselves. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. We always carry about in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive and always are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. May God add a blessing to his word, and may he bless us, and may he encourage our hearts just to be strong in him. Um, one of the things that I took out of that jump is... The, the fright, most frightening part of that is losing control. You would think that it's the height. I had confidence that, that the parachute was going to open. I had confidence that I was going to land well. I'd done it before. I knew how to stick, um, stick the landing. But it's that split second when you just jump and you feel nothing. It's that first step that's the Lulu. It's that, it's that first step um, that gets you there, which is really, really hard. But I told myself this on the ground. I said, okay. I've been through this before, the others haven't, so I can't be falling out the sky flipping and crying like I have never done this before. So I'm going to hold my cries inside. Um, um, they, they had a camera on me, so I had to watch my language. Um, no, 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 be as spiritual as you want to, but when you fall in at 120 miles an hour, stuff comes up out you. My grandma used to sing a song, everything in you got to come out. If you want to go back with Jesus, when he come, everything in you got to come out. And so that fear was down inside me. But I told myself this. I said, when it comes to jump, I will not think about it for a split second. I will not think about it, because I, this I know, if I hesitate, if I hesitate, the first brother who jumped didn't make that pact with himself. 
So when they opened the door, because you know, you know, we grew up in the early 70s, we saw Airplane, um, um, not the one with, not the one with uh, Leslie Nielsen, I mean like the real scary one, like with Dean Martin, like in the early, in the early 70s. When, when they opened the door, I thought everything was going to get sucked out. So when they opened the door just to give us the breeze, I got afraid, because I thought, oh, here we go. But the first brother didn't make that pact. And so when he got to the doorway, he messed up and said, wait, <laughs> you can't say wait. <laughs> this plane's going like 300 miles an hour, and we got to all jump on the same X. And so now you can't wait because I'm not going to jump over in the ocean. When I got this plane, I'm going to land on the X. I made one mistake getting in the plane. I'm not going to make a mistake getting out the plane. But he said, wait. But I realized that was my turn because my guy told me he's going to go first, he's going to go second, and you're third. So when it, the door was open when he said, okay, the second one went, he said, all right, scooch down, get in front of the door. I didn't even think. I don't know if it's because I passed out or because I just did what I was supposed to. But I knew that when I got to that point, I was just going to release and jump. I realize something. I contemplate the inevitable too much. I give too much thought to stuff that God has already promised is going to happen. I got to make up my mind and tell myself that when the door opens, when God says go, when God says move, when God says surrender, I'm going to do what God says do. That this jump even made me realize that the true jump did not happen in the plane. The jump happened on the ground. Before my feet left the ground, I told myself, if I hesitate in the door, I will not jump. And I'm going to frighten the people behind me. I'm going to slow the plane down. And I'm going to reduce the fun. Because the, I did not pay this money to go up here for a helicopter ride. I went up to jump. Many of us wait until we're in the moment to obey God. You've got to begin to, to contemplate today how you're going to obey, obey on Thursday. You've got to be able to say to God right now, this is what I'm about to do. This is what I'm about to do, God. I'm going to obey you when that door opens, when that bell rings, when the gun goes off, when the race starts, God. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I wait too often to get in the moment to try to get the courage and the boldness and the faith and the remembrance to say something, to do something in a moment that I should have prepared for before time. I did not go and sign my life away and put this harness on and strap myself to this strange man and put these goggles on to contemplate what I'm going to do. God saved me and raised me and chose us and picked us and elected us and put us in a position trusting that we would trust God that when the moment to go happens, we will do what God tells us to do. Now, let me tell you how the Spirit messed me up. We can take that down because that's making me sweat. Seriously, it messes with me when I see that. It's fun to share and then you just got it. Had a message wanting to preach about the Spirit, moving in it, getting ready for church today, and the Holy Spirit completely messed me up, ripped the message up, um, I mean, not literally, but you know, and just put another a word in my heart that I know is for me, but I believe it's for someone else, and it ties into this passage. And hopefully I can get into what I was going to preach today next week, but I've got to, I'm compelled to say what God is putting in my heart today for us as a body, because Fountain of Life is time for us as the people of God to move into the plan and the purpose God. Um, as I was prepping, this is, this is, the Spirit just started, just started giving me this message. So I just want to share it to you as it's, as it's come to me, as it came to me. Spirit checked me on whose opinion it is I'm concerned about. Not because I'm about to say anything bad or I'm not in trouble. No, but just, Spirit showed me that whoever, whatever opinion I'm worried about, that's who I'm worshiping. If I'm worried about what political people think, that's who I'm worshiping. If I'm worried about what funders think, that's who I'm worshiping. If I'm worrying about what my colleagues think, that's who I'm worshiping. There's a person of God, the person of faith. Every morning, I got to turn my face to God and say, God, what can I do to give you glory today? What can I do to make your heart glad today? We read of where you have repented that you've made mankind. We read of where you've repented that you called mankind. But what can I do in my mortal body through the empowerment of your spirit that will make you rejoice that you made me, saved me, set me aside, and indwelled me? Many of us are worshiping somebody that ain't God. We got our face on something. We got our image on something. We got, I mean, we got our gaze on something. But it is not and God wants us to shift it and to ask his help for doing this. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says, I'm blinded the mind of believers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
And I just want to try to minister what God is putting on my heart. I, I, am I losing battery power? Is that, is, is that what happening to me? Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm good. I just wanted to make sure because I was going to get something else if I need to do this. But it's the God of this age that has binded the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is that it is the spirit of revelation that reveals the glory of Christ to us. It helps us to understand that Christ is God, the Son of God, came to save us and redeem us and then put the life and power of God inside of us. But what bothered me and grabbed me about this passage today is that it talks about the God of this world blinding the unbelievers. If I am not an unbeliever, what am I doing blind? Read this passage and we need to understand that the God of this world has power over the people of this world. That means the unregenerated, the unrenewed, the unsaved people. The God of this world has power over the people who don't know God and don't know God's authority. But the people that have been raised by God and full of God's power and washed by the blood of Jesus are not the unbelievers, which means you have no business groping around in darkness because we are not blind. But what happens is we have made a pact with darkness and have made a pact with the lie and a pact with the enemy because he cannot blind us because we are in the light but we can make a pact to believe what he's telling us to believe and the message that I want to convey today what I just heard in my heart today was unpacking the pact many of us are boomerang boomeranging and ricocheting in our spiritual walk. We get so far and we snap back. We get so tall and we snap down. We get so deep and we snap up. Something keeps bringing us back to the same place. To the point that we're afraid to even try to grow for fear that if we take two steps forward, we're going to take three steps backwards. And we have not understood that there are things that we have said and that we have done that we don't let go of that makes it very difficult for God to do God's work in our lives. The Holy Spirit is revelation. And revelation is not just showing us nice pictures of God, but it is giving us the image, developing that revelation inside of us that we begin to believe God the way God is revealing God to us. And when God is giving us a revelation and we're not fully receiving it, we're missing what God is telling us to do. Let me give you an example. I made a pact with my pain when I was a little kid. And it's, you know, yeah, I talk about having this transparent pulpit so you can be transparent. And this is the part of preaching that's not fun. So let me just take a swig for a second. Because part of what I like to do is look intact and strong and in control. But I made a pact with pain. That when I was young, and I'm not saying this for pity, I'm just saying this because somebody needs to understand what a pact looks like. I remember when my parents separated, we moved to Madison, I was six years old. And my father rarely, if ever, I think from the time we moved here in 1970 until he passed away, I think my father made it to Madison two times in, in almost 40 years. And so I remember one time either he visited or said he was going to visit, I can't remember what it was, um, um, Maybe he promised me a bike, and he didn't get it. That I'm going to get you a bike line. And, um, and I'm trying to say this in light, because I made myself another pact, a good one, that my role would not be to disparage my father, particularly since now he has passed away. So I really say this for information and not to go off on him, because I'm not feeling sore around it, but I'm understanding where the pact lies. I said to myself as a 16-year-old, and listen, keep this in mind for your young children, particularly for your young boys, because here is a pact that we make. I said to my six-year-old self, I will never, ever let him think that I need a thing from him. I will never, ever let him think that my mother is not sufficient, so I will never make mention to him. And in my life, in my life, from the time I was six until the time he died, I never asked him for a thing. Now, that might sound like a self-made man, but let me unpack the pack. I never told my father my anger, and I never told my mother my pain. What it did was put me on an island that I don't need nobody for nothing. Growing up, having a degree, having a home, having a ministry, having a rep reputation, being renowned, having a couple of books out, having some notoriety, 
puts you further and further and further on an island. It puts you on an island that makes it hard to say, I need help. Makes it hard to say, I'm tired. Makes it hard to say, I'm afraid. Makes it hard to say, my heart is heavy. Makes it hard to say, I don't know what to do next. And so what happens is we get on this island. And then the Spirit of God comes. The Spirit of God comes. And I'm going to pack this a little bit later. I don't have enough time to do this today. The Spirit of God comes to do a number of things, a plethora of things. But one of the things the Spirit of God comes to do is this. God the Father is unbegotten, which means God is always, Father has always existed. God the Son was begotten because he was made human and came into the world. That's what it means that he was God's only begotten Son. That this was a part of God, the part of the Godhead that became human that we could see, touch, and feel. Historically, we can account for the fact that God the Son, Jesus Christ, was here in this earth. But God the Son said in John 15, I'm going back to the Father, and the Father and I are going to send the Spirit to you, which is going to proceed to you. To proceed means he's not just going to pitch at you or try to make you come out of your stance. Proceed means he's going to send it right to your address, right to your GPS, so that when I send the Spirit and the Spirit proceeds, you catch it. Don't tell me you follow God and don't have the Spirit. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. It's part of the creed we confess that God, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from God the Father and God the Son to come to us to sanctify us, yes, to give us strength, yes, to empower us. But do you know what else the Spirit comes to do? The Spirit comes to take us off the island and bring us into unity with the Godhead. That the Spirit comes to not just bless us on our island, but to bring us into the mainland of God's love. But you know what I find out? Every time the Spirit rescues me, I go, back to the, I go back to the island like Gilligan. Anybody old enough to remember Gilligan's Island? Anybody old enough or young enough to remember Lost? Lost is a serious version of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Don't come on as many channels, but it's probably a better plot. I made another pact with God. Oh, I should say this. I made another... And let me, this is why I'm saying this to you all. This, and really, I'm trying to say this to encourage you. Is it, am I about to encourage anybody? Okay, because you may not be encouraged yet, but am I about to encourage anybody? Here's the thing about a pact. God respects it. It's why none of you are accidentally saved. And it's why no one is accidentally unsaved. That when you break a pact with sin and say, God, I want you, which is why to come to Christ... We must say, God, I want you. Not just be good, not just go to church, not just sing in a choir, not just do, you must say, God, I want you. Send your power and your spirit to transform me. Because when you break that old pact, then God gives you a new pact, which is called the covenant. But unless the new covenant gives you enough power to break the old pact, you are stuck between two things. You're a halt between two opinions. You are not fully liberated, liberated. you're not fully captivated. And so you're floating around and you're tired. My rest has helped me to understand something. I made a pact with God that said, I am responsible. Because I was six, my father had never given me anything anyway. But life, for which I'm grateful. Honestly, for life and a bunch of siblings I didn't know until I was grown. <laughs> who I love dearly. Who I love dearly. I thank him for that. I appreciate him for that. Those of you who had his memorial service heard me say that. I appreciate it. But that pact to never ask him for anything wasn't going to bother him. It actually let him off the hook. I was really trying to take pain off my mom, who was worried about how that life was going to affect me. So here I am at six trying to make adult decisions in a six-year-old body. But then that six-year-old becomes 16. Then he becomes 26. He becomes 36. He becomes 46. And thinks he is responsible to make life happen, to make death stop, to make joy come, to make everything work. And I begin to realize I've got to start unpacking some of these packs that I have made. That I've got to begin to look at the new covenant that God has given me. 
that his scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3, I don't have enough time to, to go to, but you got to just mark it down, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he says, let me tell you something. Our God is sufficient. He offers you sufficiency and makes you sufficient in his grace. Our God is sufficient, who offers sufficiency, which means the same thing that makes God sufficient. What that really means is that God has never been created. Nobody said hocus pocus happened, God. Nobody said God come into being. Nobody thought of God. Nobody conjured up God. Nobody prayed of God. Nobody theologized, made God up in their theological minds. Nobody created God. God has always existed. The sufficiency that makes God always God is offered to us. Paul says that the sufficiency of God is offered to us. That same sufficiency is offered to us, but God is extending it to us while we're standing on an island making a pact with a daddy who's dead. Making a pact with some folks who hurt you and don't even know they left you in their wake. We have made a pact with a third grade teacher who don't even remember they laughed at you. Made a pact with the world that doesn't even understand you did it. Made a pact with an arrest that doesn't even remember your name. Made in a pact that when these things happen, we made a pact. This is the way life happens. But what happens to the pact when the sufficiency of God shows up? The struggle in the church is not the absence of God. It is not the absence of sufficiency. It is do we believe that what has made God a sufficient God? Do we believe that that sufficiency is offered to us? And do we believe what Paul says to the Corinthians that you have been made sufficient by God's grace? The work of the Holy Spirit is to deliver the sufficiency of God into our inefficient souls. Our insufficiency, we know what sufficiency means. We think we do, but let me give you another word. What does insufficiency mean? Or what does insufficient mean? We know what comes next. What comes after insufficient? Bonds. We know what that means. It means not enough. That means something's coming in at it, but there's not enough inside to stand up against it. So it tanks the account. It takes us negative. It puts us in the red. And then you get them real thin envelopes from your bank. You like the thick ones, that means you've been getting a lot of deposits or checks. But when that real thin one comes, uh oh, you'll be able to ball the rest of the mail but that one, because you know my bank only sent me thin mail. But sufficient. And when we feel insufficient, when we don't feel what God has given us, we make our attempts to self-medicate our pain. We don't talk about this, but I wonder if the rich young ruler, rather than just being greedy and wanting money, I wonder did he feel insufficient and money made him feel solvent. The woman caught in the act of adultery, it's easy just to call her sleazy and loose, but I wonder what she demeaned in a way that being with all these different men somehow made her feel sufficient. The woman who was caught, the woman at the well who was talked about, but we wonder what happened in her life that made her feel so insufficient and why was she at the well alone when other women weren't there? What made Moses so angry that he murdered someone? Was that, in, was that, in, was that righteous indignation? What made David so loose? If we're chasing the pact that we have made, then we're not chasing God's purpose for and then we're chasing pain and man-made remedies. This is what God wants to stop. When we come back to this passage in 2 Corinthians 4, we're told about how good God is to us. We're told that God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here is the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to speak out of our darkness, to speak in light of our pact, to speak to us and show the light of Christ, that Christ has come to show us the love of God, that we may break pact with the God of this world and live into our pact with the God of creation. The reason why this is so important is that great big pacts keep people out of church. 
great big packs that are broken when people leave church. But these subtle packs that we carry let us sing songs we don't believe, pray prayers we don't feel, blow kisses to a God we're afraid of, read a gospel that we don't fully believe, quasi worship a Holy Spirit that we are threatened by. And these packs that we have not unpacked allows us to go to church but not to the lost. It allows us to go to church but not down on our knees. It allows us to go to church but not to the altar. It allows us to go to the assembly but not be put back together. So we find ourselves going we have made packs. I know a brilliant scholar who said she made a pact when she was young. I'm going to be sad. And nothing in life was ever enough. Some of us made packs that marriage can never be good for us because of what we saw in our home. That men can never be trusted because of things that have happened to you. Church leaders can never be trusted because of things that have happened to you. Good people can never happen because of things that have happened to you. What I'm preaching about it's not about unpacking things that you feel better about yourselves because right now feeling good about yourselves is not going to help. In fact, some of us have made the pact. We're going to feel good about ourselves. We're going to look good. We're going to smell good. We're going to dress good. We're going to ride good. We're going to live good. We're going to earn good. And so we look good to the people and look good to the public, but there's no power inside. The whole seed from the Father and the Son comes to give revelation in the darkness that that pact is wrong and is holding you down. Some of you don't believe that God can really use you. Others don't believe that you really have a spiritual gift. Others don't even believe that when God returns to judge the world that you're going back with God in peace. So we mark in time making religious fervor and don't even believe in the very basics, basic tenets of our faith. God, the Holy Spirit, is in the room today to break packs that we have made with ourselves and made with others in order to live fruitfully in God. You know, this is the last pack I'm going to talk about. Then the rest of y'all, then y'all talk to guys. I'm tired of bearing my soul. I made a pact that I would limit my ability and my intelligence as a kid because it would cost me friends and because people who are limited in their education in my life would be threatened. I made a pact that I would not be smart. A lot of us are talking about, particularly with young African-American boys, that we're making pacts that we're ashamed that our friends are going to make us let me tell you, I made a pact way before I got to middle school. I made a pact way before the peer pressure. I made the pact when my stepfather misspelled my name, Alex, and spelled it A-L-X. This is not to embarrass anyone. It's just to help someone. I made it pact. I will never be smarter than him because he would then find it hard. Now, let me tell you something. I'm only saying this. Let me, you know why I'm telling all my secrets? Because I'm breaking the pact. That's why. I'm just saying, I, listen, I don't need nobody to feel sorry for me. I'm smart. <laughs> I'm brilliant. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell someone. With all the good that's happened in my life, I still fed the pact, and I didn't break it. Today, in just a moment, I'm going to call on the name of God, the Holy Spirit to begin to give us the strength to break packs. I was a class clown. I thought I was a class clown because I was funny. I was a class clown because I made a pact that I wasn't going to be smart. But because I was still intelligent, I had to still be seen. But not seen for my intelligence. See, because there was a part of me that understood I need to be front and center because I got something to say. But because my pact would not let me say who I really was, I said who I really wasn't. Is this making sense to anybody? Young men, is this making sense? 
What we got to begin to preach to people is that God will break a pact that you made with your stepfather. God will break a pact that you made with your parole officer. God will make a pact of what you made with your free lunch tickets. God will make a pact. He will break a pact that you made because of your abuser or because of someone who left you, because of someone who hurt you. God will break the pact. We don't talk about God breaking the pact. So all these folks who have secretly pacted it with the devil come to church here, but all God is offering them. But no one has taught them to break the pact that the Holy Spirit that is offering you life must first sever your death. I want you to understand God the Holy Spirit is in this room and you have made a pact with something I feel it you made a pact that you can't sing a pact you can't write a pact that you can't play a pact that you can't start business we talk about self-sabotage but not the pact that set the sabotage up so we try to rectify self-sabotage by positive actions and we have not taught people how to break Pact. The pact is from the pit of hell. The truth is from the throne of God. And if we are going to be the people of God, you got to break the pact with stability and jump out the plane. You got to leave what feels safe because that's not what's real. But there's a pact, fountain of life, that God is trying to break. It will change your marriage. It will change your interaction with your child. It will change your understanding of finances. Everything you're trying to fix is not simply fixed with budgeting or time management. You've established a pact that must be broken. And the new covenant in the blood of Jesus comes I want you to identify a pact you made. Just take two or three seconds. Team, y'all can get in place. I want you to identify a pact that you made. I'm not proud of mine, but I need you to understand what it looks like. How has that pact limited you? Second question, how has it limited God in you? How has it limited you? How has it limited God in you? Do you know for decades I could not say God the Father? How could I be a Trinitarian preacher and I can't even say God the Father? I felt like I wanted to throw up when I would say Father. Of the Father in my life. It took years for me to understand what God was identifying. The Holy Spirit identified my path. They brought me into a new agreement with God. Listen, the Holy Spirit is going to do more than give you goose pimples. It's going to give you more than a prayer language. This is all part of what the Holy Spirit can do and will do. It will do more than make you jump up and down and run the aisles and thank God the Spirit does that. But the Spirit will identify your pact and it will break it. And it will bring you into relationship with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, that you may live a joyous existence in the plans and purposes of God. Have you identified it? I need you to. I'm talking to you. How has it limited you? How has it limited God? Then I want you to ask God, the Holy Spirit, for a revelation. A revelation of the sufficiency of God, the sufficiency from God, and the resultant sufficiency inside you for the task to which you have been called. Holy Spirit, give me a revelation of the sufficiency of God. Say it with me, sufficiency of God. Sufficiency Sufficiency from God. And being sufficient because of God's grace. And being sufficient, I can't hear you, because of God's grace. 
listen, listen, listen. I want you all to know what gets me up every day, what keeps me running after the heart of God. I want you to know what makes me a worshiper. It's because the Spirit of God is revealing to me the sufficiency of God, the sufficiency from God, and how sufficient God has made me. That many things that I do that you might think are just commonplace, I do it with great, what I do with great concern and great reverential fear, but I do it as unto God. It's time for you to take the next leap. It's time for you to move from where you are and where you've been. It's time for you to move into the authority of God and the place of God. Do you all believe this? Do you believe this? It's time to unpack the pack. Listen, I need to let my father rest. Yeah, I made that pact because he wasn't there. But guess what pact God the Father made? I will be a mother to the motherless. I will be a father to the fatherless. I'll be everything you need. So for every pact you made out of brokenness, God already made out of grace. He already made out of grace. He already made out of grace. And because of that pact from God, as a young boy, God started speaking to me. I started hearing God's voice as a young boy. I started seeing visions and dreams as a teenager. Because of that brokenness and that pact, God overrode it and used that pain as an entry point into my life to introduce a new pact. I am God. I am sufficient. I offer you sufficiency and because of my grace, you stand sufficient for the task. I am not sufficient the way God is sufficient because God is all-knowing, divine, and self-sustaining. But I am sufficient efficient for the task that God has called me. I'm not efficient to do what you're called to do, but for whatever it is God has called you to do in this world, you are sufficient for it. I need you to stand to your feet. I just feel such a reverence for the spirit in this place. I just need us to stand. Not going back Moving ahead, here to declare Brian, to you let me just lower these that up my here. past is over and you, things I made new. Prayer team, let me have y'all come in this way. my life to cross, I'm moving, I'm not going back. Listen. Moving ahead, here to declare I want to say a prayer over someone. Come on, come on right to the middle. I want to say a prayer for someone. Keep going, Brother Cotton. Who feels you made a pact. Don't be ashamed about it. Don't skedaddle. Don't run. Don't move. When revelation comes, we need to act on it. But we got people up here. We may not get to everyone, so I'm just going to pray over this place. I want to turn this altar into the altar. But if you feel, you know, I've got a pact with something dark that I have not unpacked yet. And I just want a revelation from the Holy Spirit to begin to move from it. I need you to come on down front. I need you just to feel the front, feel the aisles. Don't worry if everybody doesn't get to you. Come on, let me hear y'all. Oh God, God, we moving forward. We're not looking back. We're not holding on to our past. Come on, there's still room. Come. Oh, I know you're here because the Lord interrupted my, my, my good sermon and told oh, me to preach this message. You Come on. all things new. Yes, you made all oh. things new. Hallelujah. And I yes. will follow oh God. you. Come God, Holy forward. Spirit. Come on, y'all. Let's worship. You yeah, you do. Come on, somebody still needs to come. Get up here, get up here. Somebody, God is nudging you. You made a pact. And I want to pray that God begins to break in your life. Come. Come on, find room to stand. Come on, fill the aisles. Come as an act of faith. You made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell them about it. Break these packs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you do. You make. You make. Yeah. Yeah, God. 
something. The reason why I share things that are very personal and embarrassing so that there be no embarrassment over the packs that we make. Now, God is all in this place and will move anywhere. But there are times we need to move in faith and act in faith. And I'm not doing this out of emotion. I don't need people to move to prove something to me. But I just want to say, if you know you've got a pack and you know you are stuck, just make a step and come on forward. I'm going to begin to pray in just a moment. And I'm going to pray over the whole place. But there's an act of obedience that when God moves in us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you have put this word in my heart. You told me to preach this. You even gave me the title, Unpacking the Pact. And God, I'm beginning to see that these decisions I made out of crises don't stand up when your grace has come. That God, the Holy Spirit, you have come to weave me into the family of God. You've made me a part of the family of God. You have made me intertwined and entangled in the love of God, Father, Son, Spirit. So I'm no longer an island, and I denounce those pacts. I denounce the fact that I would never ask for help. I will ask you for help. I will ask my pastors for help. I will ask the prayer team for help. I will ask my wife for help. I will ask my colleagues for help. I will ask my associates for help. I will ask for what I need in order to get your purpose done, God. God, I made myself responsible. I break that pact. God, you are all sufficient. I can't make this ministry work. I can't make this world work. I can't make my family work, but you can. Break that pact. Lord, the women and the men that are standing here have made pacts because of assault, because of weakness, because of poverty, because of brokenness, because of discouragement, because of deception. But I break the pact in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, I pray, God, that by your spirit, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will begin to move in the hearts of the people. Holy Spirit, you come, you proceed from the Father and the Son. You come to bring us into the revelatory notice and knowledge that we have been made sufficient for the task that God has given us. And so right now, I bind the devil. I use the authority that God has given me. And God, I pray that even through the preaching of this word, light has happened in men and women's heart. I pray that, that I trust you that in preaching this truth, you have given us light. You have given us light. You have given us light. And listen, you don't have to fight. You don't have to scream. You don't have to yell. You don't have to roll. You don't have to jump the pews inside your heart. Just denounce the pact. Announce the pact. The pact that you made. You're not going to be smart. That you can't come out of poverty. That you're not worthy of a good relationship. That you can't be smart. That you can't be strong. That you can't flow in God. Come on, worship team. Let's come on back in. Just denounce it. All I need you to do is begin to denounce it. I just need you to say, in the name of Jesus. Lift your voice. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I deny this pact. I cancel the enemy's assignment. I cancel the enemy's lies. I stand in agreement with God. I need to hear you. I stand in agreement with God. I stand on God's word. I stand on God's word. God, Holy Spirit. God, Holy Spirit. Release me. Release me. Release me to the new covenant of God. To the new covenant of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, y'all. Let's come back to the chorus about how he makes all things new. Come on, y'all. together and bless the name of God.
Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Some of us have made these packs because of family members too. God, I just break generational curses. I come against the lies that made us make these packs. Holy Spirit, you are the light of God that is broken into our darkness. Reveal to your people. Reveal to your people how sufficient our God is. Come on, y'all. We can come on back here so we can finish up.
Come on. Lift your voice. Feel me. 